Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. This is Sugandha. And in this video, we'll be talking about how brain is perceived as a computing device in cognitive science. Uh, in my last video, we talked about uh, how people in cognitive science and computational neuroscience have varied backgrounds um, and they come into the field, field of cognitive science or neuroscience from diverse backgrounds like engineering, computer science, mathematics, physics, etc. And today we have a guest uh, who we'll be talking to, uh, who's also from uh, an engineering background and has transitioned over uh, to doing research in cognitive science. And his name is Vinayak Agarwal. Uh, welcome, Vinayak. Thanks, Sue, for having me. Um, it's, it's great to have you here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so, Vinayak, you have a background in mechanical engineering and you are now a graduate student uh, at MIT in mechanical engineering still, but you're doing your research in cognitive science. I wonder what brought you to cognitive science and how as a mechanical engineer, do you perceive the field of cognitive science? So uh, actually that's like a really interesting story uh, because since I did my undergrad in India, like I had zero exposure to cognitive science in general. Like I didn't even know any field with this name existed. So as an undergrad at IIT Bombay, um, like I was really interested in acoustics, uh, in audio, in sound. So when I applied for grad school uh, and I was lucky enough to get to MIT, I started working in acoustics in the mechanical engineering department. After coming here, I realized that there's this field uh, which studies the brain, but more in terms of a machine, like which studies how the brain does the computations that we want our machines to do. So basically right. which treats the brain as a biological machine. And like, I was really fascinated by how well the brain solves the problems that we as mechanical engineers want our machines to solve. So like, there's so much to learn from like this marvel of, the, of nature. That's absolutely true. Uh, usually when people think of neuroscience or cognitive science, they're more thinking from the perspective of biology. And I think you bring a very good point, which is also kind of the point that our department keeps on raising of viewing the brain as a machine uh, and as a computing device and uh, then learning from the computations uh, that the brain is doing. Um, could you give us one example uh, of um, maybe such computation, which people might have learned from, uh, from the brain or uh, which people maybe hope to learn from the brain uh, and how they might use uh, something like that maybe in other fields like building artificial agents? So that's a really good question. Actually, one example that lives in our bedrooms uh, is our Google Assistant or Alexa. So like you might very well know, like when we say something to the Google Assistant or Alexa, uh, Amazon Echo devices, nowadays it is becoming better and better. But like if I shout to Google from another room, uh, the assistant may or may not recognize what I exactly said. But if there's any, any other person in the same room, and like even if there are two or three walls between me and like the person who will be listening to my voice, they'll be able to make out what I exactly said. That's true. So we can have much better sensors in the Google Assistant or Alexa, but what is it in us which that machine does not have so that it can separate out like all uh, the effect that the walls and the surroundings have put into the sound? Like what is it that makes us such a good interpreter of that sound and not that machine. So like these are some of the issues that like auditory uh, cognitive scientists, people who study audition in humans, like they're really fascinated with. Like how does human, a, a human solve these problems, solve these issues? And like, how do we build these capabilities into machine systems? That is absolutely very interesting. Um, and it's a very, you brought up a very simple example which people can relate to. But at the same time, it seems like this is a very complex problem. Um, so people might wonder how do cognitive scientists like you go about even addressing such a complex problem? 
So could you tell us a little bit about how uh, you or other people uh, in the field would approach such a problem and what kind of questions they might ask? So since I'm new to the field, uh, like I can uh, tell everyone according to what I know. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways to approach the same problem. Many cognitive neuroscientists uh, are the people like who are studying these cognitive functions from a neuroscience perspective, or they're taking readings from the brain, uh, giving people tasks, taking fMRI recordings, taking EEG recordings and trying to understand like how the processing might be happening in the brain, like which parts might be responsible for certain uh, points of this computation, et cetera. Uh, so like they're taking this route. What me and my lab, like we take the route of like top down approach mm -hmm. in which we start by doing psychophysical experiments, like just like a psychologist would do. But like we design the experiments in such a way that they tell us something about the function of the brain because of the way we choose our stimuli and the way we like ask uh, the questions, like the way we design the tasks. So like we try to first identify the brain as a black box. Like we try to identify different functions that it can perform. So that will tell us something about like what would be the algorithm that the human mind might be using to like process the audio. So this is like, this is the way we start. And like, once we know that we make inference algorithms. So we try to imagine mathematical algorithms or mathematical ways in which the brain might be solving this problem, given that we have these certain features that it can fathom say only six walls and uh, only if the volume is up to a certain level. So given all these features, we will try to think of an algorithm and then try to see whether it performs similarly as the human or not. And all these experiments are performed on human subjects. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so we do these experiments on human subjects. And once we have that algorithm, or once we try to uh, model what the humans might be doing using a mathematical algorithm, we try to perform the same experiments with the algorithm and try to see whether the algorithm and the human subjects have similar responses to similar stimuli or not. Mm -hmm. That's 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 amazing. Um, one question that I have is, um, do you also, when you're building your algorithms, you have, do you also use any insights about um, the physiology of the brain or any insights you might get uh, from the experiment or while building these algorithms? Or do you uh, come up with different hypotheses of the algorithms and then just match the results to see which of the uh, which of the models might be the best i think ideally uh, we know some physiological constraints and they certainly help us making these algorithms for example uh, a lot of uh, people might know that we can like hear frequencies between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz that's why like uh, mosquito ringtones are something that like only people below the age of 18 are able to hear because they are like really, really high frequencies. So like we know these physical constraints. So we would not make an algorithm which uses say a 30 Hertz, uh, sorry, a, a 30,000 Hertz uh, sound. But on the same hand, even if we don't put any constraints like these, solving these problems is so difficult that first we try without these if these constraints help us in some way, then we use them. And like first, purely from a mathematical point of view or from an engineering point of view, we just try to solve the problem that the human solves. If physiology helps us, like if, for example, uh, the human ear does a lot to the sound before it goes to the brain. So the physiology of the ear actually helps in the processing. So that's why some of the work that our lab has done actually has shown that if the ear would not have been there, like the external ear would not have been there, we would not have been able to hear the same way. So like, this is not just a projection uh, outside our body. Like this has a very, very specific function, even uh, like for the auditory pathway or like the processing of the sound that we are. So we definitely build those um, constraints and those physiological understandings into our models so that our models can perform better than other previous models, which did not have those constraints. That's nice. 
Um, I should also mention that uh, Vinayak is actually a graduate student in Professor Josh McDermott's lab. And I'm personally absolutely a big fan of uh, all the work that comes from your lab. Um, Thank you. Just to conclude, uh, for those who are watching, um, basically what we've said here and what Vinayak has said is that um, in the field of cognitive science, what we're doing is we're looking at brain as a computing device. And um, usually we are conducting behavioral experiments in order to get some insight about how the human might, uh, how human brain might be um, processing things and doing certain tasks. And we get some uh, indications as to what algorithms humans might be using. And then from an engineer's point of view, we would build models that try to approximate the algorithms that humans might be using. Um, and at the same time, we might try to constrain those algorithms uh, depending on uh, our knowledge of the physiology of the brain. But one very important point that, uh, that you brought up in Ayako is that you only add additional physiological features if they, if they add something to the model, specifically if they lead to some improvement in the behavior or function that you're get, getting out of the model. And I, I think that's, uh, that's a very important point uh, that you don't add unnecessary detail, details to your model unless they add something uh, of value in what you're trying to do. So uh, that's all we have for you today, just to get the point across that the, when we think of brains, uh, we shouldn't only be thinking about biology, but really in cognitive science uh, and even in computational neuroscience, increasingly people are thinking of brains as computing devices. And so one of the motivations of studying the brain is to study uh, the different computations uh, that the brain is doing, however complex or simple they may be, and then getting inspiration from them in order to build these artificial agents, but also implants uh, for humans themselves in case of any uh, you know, injuries or deficiencies or um, you know, mishaps that uh, might happen to humans. Um, so that's, that's all for, uh, for today. And um, if you would like to watch similar videos, uh, then uh, please check out the playlist at the bottom and um, also don't forget uh, to click on subscribe and the bell icon um, next to subscribe. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Vinayak. Um, hope you have a great day. Thank you.